Uh, welcome and good evening. Uh, my name is Alex Cooley. I'm uh, the director of the Harriman Institute at Columbia, and it is a great uh, privilege to welcome you to this inaugural uh, Columbia NYU New York Russia Public Policy Seminar uh, event. And I'm here along with my uh, counterpart at the Jordan Center at NYU. This is uh, uh, Josh Tucker. And this initiative arose out of um, a mutual desire um, to create more of a common New York network that's interested in Russia-related developments. Um, and especially to bring an academic perspective onto some of the most pressing uh, uh, public policy issues uh, that we see concerning Russia. This is part of a multi-year initiative that's being generously funded by the Carnegie Corporation of New York, so thank you, Carnegie. Uh, and it's also an attempt, I think, to uh, kind of define the kind of role we can play as New York-centered institutions with links to academia, um, um, the legal community, the private sector, uh, the non-for-profits, that we also have a policy community here. It's just a bit different than what happens in D.C. And perhaps one of the things that we'll discuss today is that not a lot is going on in D.C. Uh, when it comes to sort of foreign affairs. So it's just a great privilege. Um, uh, and I'm going to let Josh uh, talk a little bit about the Jordan Center and the second event that we have uh, planned, which is April 26th uh, at NYU. So uh, welcome again, and thanks for joining us. Okay, so uh, thanks very much, Alex. I really appreciate uh, the introduction, and uh, I want to welcome all of you today on behalf of the NYU Jordan Center, who's the co-sponsor of this, along with Harriman and with Carnegie. I want to thank Carnegie uh, for the funding to make this a reality. I want to thank Alex uh, for his uh, generosity in opening up this space to all of us uh, today, and I want to thank all of you for coming out uh, today. As, as Alex said, the motivation behind this was that it was in part to bring people together in New York, but also in part to really recognize that there is a sort of, uh, how shall we put it, renaissance of interest in Russia <laughs> in the country at this moment, and that more than ever, it's important to have knowledgeable voices who are speaking about Russia in the public sphere. And there's lots of different attempts and ways that we're trying to go about doing these sorts of things. But this is one contribution we felt we could make, which was to try and to sort of marshal our joint resources here to bring together scholars and people outside the scholarly community in some cases to talk about issues, but talk about them issues that are going to be of, so issues that would be of importance to a broad importance to a public audience, broad importance to policymakers, to people who are thinking about Russia, who are interested in Russia today, but to inform that conversation with the scholarly knowledge and the scholarly work that people have put into this for years and years. So we're trying to sort of bridge that gap um, and build, build bridges between people who are interested in Russia and people who are, you know, have spent their lives working on Russia or working on other scholarly topics that are related to this. So, um, it's a great pleasure to see this coming to fruition tonight, to see all of you here today. I'm very much looking forward to the panel. I think if we can get NYU and Columbia working together, maybe we can solve the U.S.-Russian relations problem as well. Um, <laughs> uh, but, and I want to also just ask you to, to, to jot, while I have your attention here today, jot down your calendars. On <clears throat> April 27th, we'll have the second uh, meeting of the seminar for this semester. It'll be at NYU. As Alex said, for the next few years, we're going to be having at least one meeting at each campus each semester and we'll see if more if the demand is there but April 27th the same time 5 to 7 at the NYU Jordan Center which is on 19 University Place and we're going to be talking about Compromat so it's going to be the theme will be Compromat everything you always wanted to know but we're too scared to ask about in public because of Compromat no <laughs> anyway the talk will be about Compromat we're going to bring together uh, two scholars who've worked extensively on this Keith Darden and Katie Pierce and they'll be joined by Miriam Elder um, from BuzzFeed Global. So we're very much looking forward to that event. We're looking forward to hope to see many of you there downtown for that event as well. And now I'm going to turn it over to Alex to introduce our panelists. Thanks so much, Josh. So, uh, so today's topic uh, that we decided to kick things off is called uh, the reset trap. Uh, and by this we mean looking at the potential for U.S.-Russian relations uh, to reset and evaluating other post-Cold War resets, what went right, what went wrong, and why. Uh, the panel is a distinguished one. You have their full bios here, so I'm not going to give extensive introductions, but I do uh, want to mention them in the order that they'll be speaking. Um, first off, uh, 
is uh, Yuval uh, Weber, who is a visiting uh, assistant professor in the Department of Government at Harvard University uh, and a research fellow at the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian uh, Studies at Harvard. He's actually uh, on leave from National Research University at the Higher School of Economics um, in Moscow, in Russia, where he is an assistant professor. Um, his work focuses on sources of liberal and anti-liberal dissatisfaction for powers in the international system, uh, and he has been writing extensively on uh, these topics of international order and U.S.-Russia relations. Uh, in the middle, Daniel Nexon. He's an associate professor in the Department of Government and the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown uh, University. Dan is not known as a Russia expert, uh, but Dan uh, wears a number of hats that make his perspective valuable to, the, uh, to this conversation. Um, first, Dan is lead editor of International Studies Quarterly, one of the field's preeminent journals, and in that capacity, he's really taken the journal into exploring new and important topics. He was also one of the co-founders of the Duck of Minerva, one of the most widely related IR blogs, um, and he is a scholar of international order and international dynamics. Less known to you might be the fact that Dan actually worked at the Pentagon during the reset, uh, and actually, uh, uh, as he'll, he'll describe, has experienced what the reset was about um, and what it aimed to accomplish. So all of these perspectives come in, and we're really uh, excited that Dan is with us. And then, oh, Steve Kotkin. Um, almost forgot now. Uh, Steve Kotkin is, of course, the John uh, Berkland professor, 1952 professor in history and international affairs in the Woodrow Wilson School and History Department of Princeton University, uh, where he also directs the Princeton Institute for International and Regional Studies and co-directs the program, The History and Practice of Diplomacy. He is no stranger to Harriman. He is a friend of Harriman. As he was saying before, he is very much in demand now, and we're grateful uh, that he always uh, answers our call and, and informs us with his unique insights. Uh, amongst uh, the projects that uh, you would be aware about, he's working on a Stalin trilogy, and I understand volume one is that volume two is about to come out, and, and volume three is uh, on the way. Uh, he, uh, his essay, uh, Russia's Perpetual Geopolitics, appeared in Foreign Affairs in 2016. Another piece I'm a great fan of is called Trashkanistan from 2002, where he issued the first warnings about ignoring the U.S.-Russia relationship uh, in favor of pursuing other uh, objectives um, at the time in Central Asia and other places. So uh, it's a really great panel. Uh, what we'll do is we'll go for 20 minutes for each presenter and then we'll open it up to audience. Uh, just a reminder, this is being live streamed and it's very much on the record. So if you ask a question, you'll be asked to identify yourself and your institutional affiliation. So you've all, uh, first up, thank you. Okay, so yes. Um, so for hopefully those uh, at home can see, uh, this is of course uh, President Trump on the left and President uh, Putin on the right. And давайте вместе снова сделаем мир великим. Let's make the world great again together. So first of all, I wanted to thank uh, Josh Tucker and Alex Cooley for inviting me. This is uh, very generous of you, thank you. And to Carly and Yana for organizing my trip. Uh, so for this event, Alex and Josh have asked me to present the Russian perspective on US-Russia relations and prospects for improved relations under President Trump. To give a little background on myself, I'm currently at Harvard University, but I'm on leave from the Higher School of Economics in Moscow, where I'm, one, or I'm only one of two American political scientists in Russia focusing on international relations. So my talk will take us from here, uh, George H.W. Bush and Gorbachev in happier days, Boris Yeltsin and Bill Clinton in very happy days, two less happy days of President Trump, uh, Obama and Trump, and potentially here. The crux of my talk will be to explain Russia's dissatisfaction with not being recognized as a great power. This might seem arcane, but it is central to international politics. Being a great power in the sense of how politicians think about it is having the ability to set the rules of international political and economic interaction or having the ability to carve out exceptions for oneself. Holding great power status is when others recognize that fact and operate from it, bringing to mind Margaret Thatcher's more general definition of power. As she said, power is like being a lady. If you have to tell people you are, you aren't. So for Russia, Russia is a great power, 
the post-Soviet grand strategy, as it were, is threefold. To be recognized as a great power, to have its political preferences on international issues taken seriously, and by extension three, uh, to have the ability to set the rules of international political and economic interaction or to carve out exceptions. What we've seen over Vladimir Putin's tenure in power in terms of discrete foreign policies is his drawing upon various sources of legitimacy, religion, conservatism, anti-globalism, anti-Westernism, multipolarity, and engaging in various acts, such as the annexation of Crimea, support to anti-government separatists in Ukraine, support to the government of Syria and its head, uh, Bashar al-Assad, and so forth. These are all meant to demonstrate collectively Russia's greater latitude to act, with the intent that at the end, somehow, Russia is recognized as a great power by other great powers and accepted into the club. So in essence, in the picture that uh, you see here, uh, hopefully the people at home as well, is there is, of course, you know, the symbol of Russian bear, you know, the symbol of sort of great Russian might. But the three images behind it are the military, the traditional culture and religion, and the symbols of the Russian state. These are the things that effectively make Russia great. So what explains Russia's, uh, n Russia not being recognized as a great power by others when Russia thinks about it, thinks about themselves in that way? And where does Russia's dissatisfaction come from? I'll argue that this emerges from the ambiguous overlap of the end of the Cold War and the end of the Soviet Union. And this helps explain the Russian side of US-Russia relations. In short, the question of Russia's status that drives the basic tension between Russia, its adversaries, and its allies revolves around when the current period of history begins. For those in the West, there are a number of potential events. It could be the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe and Soviet withdrawal defining the end of the Cold War. It could be the first Iraq war and George H.W. Bush's advancement of a new world order. It could be the end of the Soviet Union itself. Or it could be, as uh, those of us are in age recall, it's the economy stupid. The change of US priorities and Bill Clinton's 1992 election victory signaling a new era of American politics that relatively de-emphasized foreign affairs. But long story short, there could be many of these. For the Russians, there is no confusion. It is the Malta summit of December 1989. And as we have here, the Time Magazine cover, Building a New World. And just as a piece of advice, if you ever do something so great they make a commemorative stamp for you, uh, you know, that's recognition that it's a job well done. At the Malta summit, uh, from the Russian perspective, at the Malta summit, it is Gorbachev who ended the Cold War when he recognized that the Soviet Union could no longer maintain the superpower competition. The deal between the United States and the Soviet Union at that time was a product of material constraints on Russia's side and Gorbachev's use of new thinking to reframe the Soviet Union as a moral power. It ended glo global superpower competition and affirmed Soviet non-intervention into Eastern Europe to maintain the socialist allied governments. This deal, acknowledged that the Soviet Union may not be a superpower any longer, but that it remained a leading power in European and international security. The acknowledgement that Russia mattered in setting the rules of international political interaction was not in doubt. And in November, December 1989, the Soviet Union was clearly a great power. This was a deal that Gorbachev could have lived with and Putin could live with today. In this perspective, even if the Soviet Union came to an end two years later, at the end of 1991, the Russian Federation, as the successor of the Soviet Union, should have inherited the Soviet Union's great power status. The Russian inability to defend its regional positions should not have avo avoided the underlying agreement, but nevertheless, the expansion of Euro-Atlantic alliances, the European, and, European Union and chiefly NATO, represents revisionism on the West part, and specifically American betrayal to take advantage of Russia when it was down. The historian Mary Surratt paints the picture of between Gorbachev and between uh, James Baker, the Secretary of the State at the time, is that when Bush, uh, so when the American side, when they come to an agreement, uh, 
unless it's written down, goes through the Senate, goes through that formal process, it's just a couple words. Whereas from Gorbachev's side, two great men come into a room, shake on it, come to an understanding, that's what matters. And so this is the, di so this is the divergence. There was no agreement written down, but there was perhaps an implicit agreement. That's a question for historians such as Professor Kotkin to, to go through, but from the Russian perspective, they left Malta with a deal that was good forever and ever, and that's the deal that they don't have today. So what were the consequences? Of course, German reunification um, that set the precedent for institutional absorption of former communist states into Western political structures. The NATO expansion, from, you know, as we can see from 1990 to 2009, was quite large. And enlargements of the European Union, again, over time. So in essence, what is the goal of Russian grand strategy? Sort of what's the big picture? The Russian side of US-Russia relations and the, and the big point is Russia cycling through various approaches to achieve its main strategic goal, to be recognized as a great power to renegotiate the expansion of the Euro-Atlantic alliances. So in the interest of time, we'll skip ahead to President Putin to sort of get us to where we are today. And this is from one of the early sort of transfers of power. Uh, in Fiona Hill and Clifford Gaddy's excellent book, Mr. Putin, and again, uh, Fiona Hill might be the new uh, Russian Europe director at the National Security Council, uh, and I highly encourage people to, to read her, her and Cliff Gaddy's book. They review the different aspects of Mr. Putin's career and show that he has a single goal, to make Russia great again, but is flexible in his personas and policies to get that done. So for US-Russia relations, he has cycled through three different approaches to make that happen. The first one, cooperation. Uh, upon the, and so just as, a, as, a, as an aside, the number of happy smiling pictures between George W. Bush and Vladimir Putin, if you go into Google image searches, almost countless. There, there was a lot, of, a lot of enthusiasm at the time. And as we know, the first foreign leader to call uh, President Bush after the terrorist attacks of September 11th was Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin was as cooperative as could be, but uh, over time, that cooperation was able to get um, discrete policy gains for the US side in prosecuting the Afghan war. But from there, the big issues were not addressed. The second approach that the, the Vladimir Putin and the Russian side used, balancing. So this is a picture from the run-up to the Iraq war. Uh, so this particular picture is from late summer 2002. And whereas Russia understood and Vladimir Putin understood that it was impossible to stop the United States from going into war directly, there was an idea, if you recall, to ally with France and uh, Germany in order to try and slow down the march to war. Again, as we, can, as we know, that failed as well. So that leaves the third approach, violent revision of the existing European and international security order. And the, the caption on the left side, for those probably who can't read, um, it's sort of, so it's a picture of Bashar al-Assad and uh, Vladimir Putin in military fatigues, and it said, so time for machismo, and the time for real men. So Professor Nexon will discuss the, the Obama-Putin reset, but suffice it to say from the Russian perspective, it saved the relationship following the 2008 Georgia war and produced concrete policy achievements. But as soon as the underlying dissatisfaction about Russia's great power status and pretensions were not addressed, well, then here we are. So when we get to the current time and sort of what is the basis of the controversy today, it comes from, of course, the events on the Maidan in Kiev. For reasons I'll elucidate in a moment, the strategic importance of Ukraine was which trade bloc it was going to go into. Russia needed Ukraine inside the Eurasian Economic Union to make that a viable multilateral bloc in order to have its own version of the European Union, to have its own version of NAFTA, to be taken seriously as a great power with uh, a series of political, economic, and security allies around it. Without Ukraine, the Eurasian Economic Union is Russia, Kazakhstan, and a few other fairly small states. 
and it does not set up Russia to control a region. And being a regional hegemon is a key job requirement for being a great power. So when the Yermaidan chased Viktor Yanukovych from Kiev and then Ukraine, Putin was faced with the situation that any post-Maidan government was going to be pro-Europe at best and anti-Russia at worst. So Crimea was taken as Putin recognized that without Ukraine, the Eurasian Economic Union had more or less reached its effective zenith and would thereafter decline relative to its peer competitors. Thus, facing a commitment problem wherein Putin could not trust others not to take advantage of a weaker Russia in the future, Russia annexed the peninsula, and the rest is probably fairly familiar to those in the audience. So then we get to our current elections. Before I move to, um, to Cambridge from Moscow uh, late in the summer, the US election was, of course, a huge new news item in Russia, as it was most places in the world. There was zero expectation that Trump would win, and the leaks of damaging information were explicitly meant, or at least understood, to hamstring a future President Clinton. She was expected by Moscow to maintain President Obama's neo-containment policy and really turn the screws on Russian interests in Syria and Ukraine. So best to have her limp over the finish line and be consumed by domestic difficulties. In this environment, I helped invite uh, Carter Page, uh, who was candidate Trump's then advisor on Russian energy, to Moscow to present to Russian audiences the contours of Trump's Russia policy. Mr. Page was careful to note that he was speaking privately, but his message echoed the candidate. Eliminate democracy and human rights as planks of US foreign policy, end sanctions, and restore bilateral cooperation. It piqued a lot of interest, but it seemed like a pipe dream at the time. The interest in Page and in Trump was that this message dovetailed perfectly with what Putin had been advocating for years, a concert of Vienna-type systems of great powers coordinating on issues of transnational importance, like international terrorism, climate change, and so forth, um, providing public goods, especially security in their own regions, and keeping out the spheres of influence of their fellow great powers. But a concert of Vienna system for the 21st century, which is in fact just wider, to include the BRICS nations, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, plus Germany, plus the United States. And so in that conception, Russia would be a great power, along several others, just as was reached at Malta in December 1989. So Trump's election seemed to pave the way uh, for this world, but without having to fight a world war. And the ideological affinity between the two overlapped on crucial measures. Both seem to doubt the security and governance architecture of the post-World War II order. Both advocated anti-globalization and defensive nationalism in the state. And both have a very easy attitude on overlaps between business and the state. So following the inauguration, Russia in the short term, and this is where sort of we think about where uh, prospects for cooperation comes from, Russia in the short term needs Trump to fulfill his anti-ISIS uh, pledges in Syria. The, Prohibiting immigrant, uh, migrants that come to the United States may, may be good in terms of uh, ruining the brand value of the United States, but what Russia actually needs is US attention in Syria itself. And they need the assistance there for the United States to bring its overwhelming military capabilities on the anti-ISIS uh, uh, anti front. This would create the international coalition of, against terrorism that is part of um, the concert of Vienna system that I mentioned a moment ago, alleviate pressure on the Assad government, and shift the ownership of the Syrian war back to the United States. But of course, disappointment in the Russian uh, public sphere and in the Russian media is very high because Russia itself, obviously here in the United States, is uh, suffering or enjoying a renaissance of attention, but it's the hot button issue directly. In terms of improved relations between the countries, we have still yet to see anything, uh, anything concrete and Russian politicians are already feeling the disappointment of a, pres of a new president failing to fulfill his campaign pledges. They blame elite Russophobia for what hasn't happened, and they find themselves in a catch-22. The more Trump pursues the policies the Russians seek, even if sincere, even if motivated simply by policy, the more it looks suspect. So whatever short-term gains will result in renewing Russophobia in the United States 
in the long term. So in terms of conclusion, because I see Alex is uh, motioning me off, Russia wants to be taken seriously as a great power so that external pressure on it can be relieved. So the policy advice, number one, don't underplay the foreign policy objectives of Putin, of Russia. However, at the same time, don't overplay Russian actions and capabilities. Russia needs the United States far more than the other way around. So ho hopefully that was of interest, and I will now cede the time to uh, Professor Nexon. Thank you for your attention. What I'm primarily going to do is talk a little bit about how to understand the reset as the backdrop for any, the pursuit of any kinds of changes in U.S.-Russian relations today. Uh, and I'm also going to remark a little bit on what I see as the room or lack thereof for significant alterations in that bilateral relationship. So if you go back, you know, in, in fact, it was nice because a bunch of the material that, that I sort of thought I might need to cover was covered. Um, if we go back to 2008, um, you know, this is election season uh, in the United States. And of great significance is the Bucharest NATO summit where George W. Bush pushes very, very hard for a membership action plan for Ukraine and for Georgia. Um, sort of parenthetically, this is a little bit odd because there's no way that George Bush is going to get the membership action plan over German and French objections. Nonetheless, he really kind of falls on his sword uh, and is able to get a kind of compromise through that notionally Georgia and Ukraine will have the ability to join NATO, the NATO alliance at some point in the future. Regardless of whether or not this is the kind of final straw, um, by August, as you know, depending on how you look on it, Russia has, but the way I see it, uh, Russia essentially successfully baits Saakashvili into uh, initiating a conflict uh, in the region, which then allows the Russians to come in uh, and uh, systematically dismantle the Georgian armed forces and creates uh, a real crisis uh, in U.S.-Russian relations, the likes of which had not been previously seen. Uh, so that you have even discussion at very high levels within the national security apparatus about uh, the United States taking a fairly hardline action in response. There are plans floated, for example, to fly F-22s over Georgia. Ultimately, the United States settles on a kind of split the difference policy of sending resupply a resupply ship to Georgia, but a military resupply ship to signal the possibility of inadvertent escalation. Uh, and through the efforts of um, primarily France, but other European countries, the conflict is resolved, right? Um, and the US comes in with lots of aid to help shore up the Saakashvili regime uh, at the end of, of the conflict. Now, what's important to note here is that the, the Georgia-Russia conflict uh, is uh, also uh, incredibly resonant in the US presidential campaign. Um, Obama is running on a pledge to, in essence, as the term we would now use, reset a bunch of hostile U.S. relations. So Obama has uh, been arguing, in fact, criticized not just uh, in the general election campaign, but also by Hillary Clinton in the primaries, for the notion that he will reach out with a velvet glove, which will become an iron fist of various kinds of countries that relations are bad with, you know, sort of refuse to cooperate or refuse to come to the table, refuse to, to negotiate uh, the relationship. Uh, and so uh, he's running on essentially a kind of soft line policy towards countries that the U.S. has an adversarial or, or a poor relationship with, not only Russia, but Iran and others. When the Georgia war happens, Obama comes out with a fairly tepid statement about how both sides need to tone it down, work this out peacefully, and immediately comes under very heavy criticism uh, for not backing the Georgian government. Um, and then issue, the campaign issues a second statement, uh, which is much harder on Russia uh, and more pro-Georgian in its proclivities. The reason I mention this incident is not only, of course, is the, the, the Russia-Georgian war the kind of complete collapse of uh, U.S.-Russian relations that the Obama administration inherits, but it's also, um, I have heard, although I cannot confirm, a fairly pivotal time within the campaign itself. Um, in the sense that, on the one hand, there's a lot of concern that uh, this could tip the campaign for McCain, right? That it could make uh, Obama's policies look weak uh, and look detrimental to U.S. national security interests. It could 
sort of undermine the rationale for Obama foreign policy. On the other hand, there's an argument that's going on within the campaign itself about what U.S. policy should be vis-a-vis -vis Georgia, right? If, the, if McCain's reaction is this proves that the Russians are aggressive and that you cannot try to make nice with the Russians, then what is the Obama administration's response? What, the, what will be the Obama campaign and then administration's response? And so there are people who are in fact initially very pro-Georgian and see this in fact as proof of Russian perfidy. Uh, there are others who argue that in fact um, the story is much more complicated uh, and that the Georgian government may have a lot to answer for in terms of this escalation. Uh, and this debate kind of winds up getting uh, played out then over the next few months. So of course, Obama wins the election, right? And a new administration comes in with a plan of some sort to implement a change in U.S.-Russian relations, right? And this is the policy that becomes known as the reset. Now, what was the reset about? Well, the reset basically began with the presumption that the status quo was really bad, right? That the United States had essentially no effective bilateral ties with the Russian government. And this was not the way for two major powers to interact with one another, right? So at a minimum, there's a notion that the United States needs to restore some sense of normalcy in the U.S.-Russian relationship. Now, that normalcy has not just been upended by the, 2000, the August War. That, norm, that lack of normalcy is the result of a long period of drift in which the Bush administration systematically ignored Russian concerns and interests on a variety of policy fronts, not the least of which uh, the Orange Revolution in Ukraine, the Keller Revolutions more generally, the Rose Revolution in Georgia, uh, and the sort of, the, and look to be repeating the pattern of US, uh, ex, sort of US sphere of influence expansion. But there are a whole set of issues where Putin, who had expected a, a grand coalition against terrorism, winds up getting basically nothing right, from the Bush administration. So the Obama administration's wager uh, is that the status quo is really bad, right? and this needs to be changed. If you actually look at the state of US-Russian cooperation, there's not very much going on. Um, certainly none of the normal kinds of things you expect about. The only bright spot is the successor programs of the non-Lugar Cooperative Threat Reduction programs, that is the programs that um, where the U.S. helps to pay for security uh, in uh, Russian nuclear facilities, that was still kind of going on, right? But pretty much nothing else was. This program, by the way, was terminated um, uh, after uh, the Crimea conflict, although it was probably on the ropes anyway. I, 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 my wife worked in it, so I have some sort of special uh, fondness uh, for it. Um, but, the, um, but beyond that, the notion that you need to kind of restart things, that you need to get a normal relationship, I don't think my sense is that there wasn't a whole lot of consensus about what the reset meant, right? And this is very typical of early Obama administration foreign policy or, or Obama administration policy period, which is, you know, there'd be a, a, some speeches or some events and then not a lot of guidance to follow that up, right? So that within the executive branch, you would then have fights over the meaning of those policies uh, that would affect then the implementation of the policy. So uh, for a lot of the early Obama administration, there's an ongoing fight about what exactly to do about Georgia, right? Whether to be fairly close to Georgia or whether to really kind of freeze that relationship as part of the reset. And, and those debates basically carry out over the first few years. Um, but in essence, beyond this kind of disagreement, there is a logic to the reset. The idea is that the status quo is really bad, there's no relationship, and so you need to do some sort of dramatic event. Um, this was, of course, poorly pulled off, but a dramatic event in which you sort of signal we are willing to rethink this. Right? We want to have a normal relationship. Right? Uh, and the Russians, as I understand it, were, 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 were pretty into this notion. I mean, they thought it was goofy, but like the idea that the United States wanted to shift course from the Bush administration. Here's where the logic of the reset gets really interesting. The idea is that if you want to build, uh, ultimately, a new status quo with Russia that's, that serves everybody's benefit, then you have to begin by doing low-level cooperation on quote unquote, low hanging fruit. That is things that um, you think are areas of joint cooperation that Russia will see as, as fairly in its interests, right? So easy to kind of, easy to do cooperation. And one of the feelings is that will be New START, uh, the, the renegotiation of the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty. Uh, this actually uh, turns out to be more difficult than was envisioned but it's seen as something that both the US and Russia want, so it should be low-hanging fruit. To ramp up uh, cooperation on Afghanistan, right, that had already begun under the Bush administration, where it was very clear 
to the Obama administration that Russia may have some you know, sense of you know, uh, schadenfreude at what was happening in the US and Afghanistan, but fundamentally was very worried about Islamic terrorism and Afghanistan as being a breeding ground for terrorism that could affect Russian interests. So you get things like New START going, you get things like uh, the, the programs that will eventually produce the Northern Distribution Network going with the Russians, uh, and you also kind of start to ramp up the kind of nuts and bolts of cooperation. So you start to explore the ability, you know, basic military to military cooperation, for example. Just, you know, having meetings, having talks, um, having get-togethers, mutual tours, that sort of thing. And that it, when this starts to then bear fruit or show that the U.S. is serious, you can start to, the, the arg argument was you could start to move to more difficult cooperation, right? So you could start to tackle things like Iran, where the United States believed there was a mutuality of interests, uh, even though uh, the Russians might have to be convinced of that, right? So you start really kind of pushing on, let's have a multilateral arrangement to try to deal with the Iranian nuclear weapons issue. Um, you have potentially up the sort of road ballistic missile defense cooperation. One of the things that the Obama administration does coming in very early is it terminates the Bush ballistic missile defense arrangement in Europe, the so-called third site arrangement, which involved ground-based interceptors in Poland and a radar in uh, the Czech Republic. <laughs> this actually was kind of bobbled because the, the announcement was made before the polls were informed what the United States was up to. But, you know, this is the kind of stuff you see early administrations and, you know, it got, got worked out. Uh, so the United States then shifts to something called, that becomes eventually known as the European Phased Adaptive Approach, right? And this is based on, uh, it's actually uh, drawn up during the campaign, but then it's, it's developed through an assessment at the beginning of the Obama administration. This was actually rolled out right when I showed up at the, the Pentagon, which is why I remember it vividly. But um, the idea, and this is the, the approach that we now see that has interceptors in Romania and, and, is, and, is start, and is now interceptors in Poland, but the idea was you would uh, basically be able to have layers of anti-ballistic missile capability that could be tailored to handle the evolving Iranian uh, threat. And because it was focused, A, because it was focused on, so clearly on the Iranian threat and on this layering, it might not be as frightening to the Russians, besides being technically a better way of approaching it as far as the Obama administration was concerned, but also it might take off the table the kinds of symbolic issues with having uh, these sites in former Warsaw Pact countries, right, and certainly in Poland, right. So there was a notion there that not only was it a good plan, but it would start to, to be some of this show of uh, U.S. goodwill that would help uh, help with that relationship. But that was just the kind of start of it, and the idea was eventually you wanted to bring the Russians on board with ballistic missile defenses, because the United States wa wanted to make it very clear, and had been trying to make it very clear since the Bush administration, that, ballistic missile that these systems were not designed to intercept Russian retaliatory capability, and that they were not technically capable of that, that there was no way that the U.S. could use them to erode Russian uh, uh, nuclear capabilities. Uh, and so the idea was that eventually you would actually bring the Russians in to some degree right, uh, have some sort of joint arrangements to understand that this was targeted at other kinds of capabilities that perhaps the Russians might find threatening as well. So you begin to deal with these thornier issues, right, ballistic missile defenses are extremely thorny because of their connection to the end of the Cold War, uh, uh, both symbolically and materially. If that works out, you can start pushing forward in other things, like maybe more nuclear arms control, right, so the United States is already thinking about what will come after New START. Um, it's thinking in terms of tactical nuclear weapons, for example, eh. <laughs> whether or not this was ever feasible, you know, we, we'll never know. <laughs> but the notion is you would move to then these progressively harder issues, right? These issues that would require more trust, a tighter cooperative arrangement. And that ultimately what you wanted to do then was you wanted to reach uh, a way of trying to resolve these problems in the near abroad, right? These conflicts over the disposition of countries like Georgia, Ukraine, which are really the kind of hardest issues as the US understood it, and it sounds like as Russians understood it as well. If you could do that, if you could do this whole process out, the end state that um, was imagined was an end state essentially to use the language that the Obama administration used with China, was that Russia would be a responsible stakeholder in the international system. Now, Alex says I should emphasize this because it, he says it's actually not very well appreciated, right? But the theory here was that the U.S. understood Russia was a great power, and the U.S. wanted to treat Russia like a great power, but that it didn't see the way that Russia understood the script of being a great power as being the, the way that you should be a great power in the 21st century, right? So if the Russian script is having hegemony 
over their neighbors, right? Having buffer zones, controlling the foreign policy and domestic autonomy, destiny of places like Ukraine or the stands or places like that. If it understood it as a kind of set of prerogatives along those lines, that was atavistic 19th century foreign policy thinking, right? And really, what a modern great power does is it recognizes that Russia should recognize that Russia is secure, that the US is not interested in invading or overthrowing the Russian regime, either militarily or via some color revolution or other. Uh, and that, in fact, it's a kind of concert, but not the kind of great power spheres of influence concert that I think um, we just heard about, a, a more kind of multilateral collective action problem, public goods providing system, right? One that could tackle pro big, big global threats like terrorism, like pandemics, like climate change, and so on and so forth, right? And so the US could kind of nudge through this process a way for the Russians to re-understand what it means to be a great power. Now, you'll notice this is on American terms, right? That this is how the United States understands itself as a great power, right? You also notice that it leads to some kind of weird kinds of dynamics. So the United States, US officials would routinely give speeches, right, in which they would say that uh, the countries like Ukraine or Georgia ought to have their, decide their own destiny, right? They have foreign policy autonomy, they are sovereign nations. So ultimately, who they want to ally with, what blocks they want to join, what regional trading groups they care about, that's up to them, right? Now, to the United States, this sounds, if, you, if you're in the United States, this sounds like an argument against spheres of influence. The US would say, there, modern great powers do not have spheres of influence, right? This is not appropriate, right? So this sounds fine if the United States. However, if you're looking at this from the perspective of a second tier great power, what this sounds like is, it's all the American sphere of influence, right? Um, that is, anybody can join our alliance system anytime they choose, um, which means, by definition, you don't have a sphere of influence. Right? I mention these two issues because I think they get at the heart of um, this issue that takes us into why the system may have fallen apart, why the reset may have ultimately failed, uh, or failed at kind of at the end game. So the question is, what is the United States doing, and what are the concessions it's offering? Right, as part of this arrangement. And I think from the United States perspective, uh, it was easy to see what kinds of concessions it was offering at a very low level transactional level. We bargain out New START in a way that's mutually agreeable. The US is making concessions there, right? Uh, the United States will take it easy, right? We'll roll back a bit some of uh, Bush's plans, for example, for security cooperation with Georgia, right? That sounds like a concession. Right? Even though the U.S. is still funding the government, even though the U.S. is still training Georgian troops to be part of the ISAF, the, the Afghanistan Stabilization Force. Um, the United States is bringing Russia into the conversation on ballistic missile defenses, but the United States is not really bringing Russia in because the U.S. doesn't want its technology stolen. Right? Uh, so the U.S. is not doing deployments of U.S. forces in Poland, but the, the EPAA plan calls for Romania, right? another former Rorschach Pak country. So there's an argument can make that there's actually not a lot of concessions being made here, right? There's a lot of mutually beneficial cooperation, and in fact, the reset was very successful at instituting that mutually beneficial cooperation. But when it comes down to things that the U.S. is giving up, it doesn't look like there's that much, potentially, if you are a Russian policymaker. Moreover, I think the United States very much saw this as situations in which there were no concessions to be made because the U.S. just wasn't interested in doing the kinds of things that the Russians thought the U.S. was interested in doing, right? So the United States had no interest, they would argue, policymakers would argue, in destabilizing Russia. But that wasn't on the agenda. Right? The United States was not trying to democratize Russia. Um, the United States would argue that it was not, the idea of more, more concessions on BMD was ridiculous because this is not a system that could ever interfere with Russian retaliatory capability. So what is the issue here? Americans would argue, right? In fact, I, I will say that the United States tried very hard with technical schematics, with, with glossy PowerPoint presentations to point out that this system could never really interfere with Russian retaliatory capability, right? But, you know, these kinds of things, are they concessions or are they just saying, hey, we're, we're good guys, right? And you should recognize that. So when, what happened, right? Why did this collapse? I've offered one sort of story uh, the, that goes under a, a kind of a basket of stories I'd call that the theory behind the reset was flawed, right? 
So one reason why the reset might have been thawed was that it had this transactional approach, right? Remember, the theory is you increase trust and confidence through repeated instances of cooperation on harder and harder and harder things. If you know your basic international relations theory, this is, neo this is what neoliberal institutionalists call tit for tat cooperation. This is the theory underlying the reset, right? Um, and the argument here would be that, that it's possible to get these win-win situations when they're easy, right? Or even when they're a little bit difficult, but you're never tackling the underlying issue from Russia's perspective, right? You're never tackling the big concerns about recognizing its great power status and treating it the way it wants to be treated as great power. So you're just pushing off or kicking the can down the road on the things that really matter to Moscow. A second argument, which is related, was that there really just is a fundamental divergence of interests here, right? Um, and fundamentally, uh, to get ahead of myself, because I'm running out of time, uh, the liberal order serves U.S. interests really, really well, right? It is, in fact, the entire order was established and set up in ways that favored U.S. power influence and economic um, economic growth, right? So this is a, a system that, that embeds the United States in a vast network of alliances, right? That only expanded after the Cold War. A vast network of influence, and it's a thing that the Russians really lack, right? The Russians don't have much in the way of overseas bases. They have very few allies, right? So this is a huge asymmetric advantage for the United States, and if what the Russians want is to renegotiate the terms of that order, that's a tall order, right? Uh, that means essentially the United States giving up a lot Right for what better relations with a country that is has nuclear weapons but is ultimately a second tier power. Right. Another argument is that essentially uh, we can get too um, caught up in who's to blame and forget the primacy of Russian domestic politics. Right. So in 2010 uh, we started to see an uptick in anti-Western rhetoric. Right. And the assumption I think around where I hung out was that this uptick was largely just normal Russian electoral campaign stuff, right? The Russians always ramp up the, the, the rhetoric when there's, a campaign, when there's a campaign or election coming, but then, you know, it gets dialed down, right? And, and that's okay. But I think you could argue you did not see that get dialed back, right? That this was actually the start of a major ramp up in anti-Western sentiment, which was, you could then argue, was essentially related to, um, was essentially a function of, uh, domestic stability problems in Russia, right? Conscious decisions by the government to deal with increasing dissatisfaction with the regime and with uh, the economic environment by uh, othering, by scapegoating the West. You could also point to specific developments. Um, uh, I think it would be interesting to find out from experts how much the Libya intervention mattered here. Because if this whole story I've told you about Russia becoming a responsible stakeholder and having a voice is the story of the reset, right? Then Libya is the case where the United States appears to treat Russia that way and then ultimately seems to circumvent Russian interests, right? That is, takes the intervention much further than the Russians and the Chinese believed that they were signing on for, right? You could t point to what I said above, changes in Russian domestic politics. The problem is not the theory. The problem is just that these domestic issues get in the way. Uh, or you maybe really it's Syria, ultimately, uh, that Kind of, it's the fact that the United States is now starting to destabilize, revolve destabilizing the last extra Eurasian ally of uh, the, well, it's Eurasian ally, the last extra regional ally, all right, of the Russians. Uh, and then ultimately we've heard the, the story that really it's Ukraine that kills this off. But it's important to note that the reset is running out of steam well before Syria and Ukraine hit. So I'm out of time, uh, so maybe we can uh, leave some of the prognosis to the Q&A but I will just reiterate what I said above. It's very hard to see a win-win that involves a major reset in the relations the way that we've heard that Russia might want it. Um, and it's hard to see that because it's hugely disadvantageous for the United States, I would argue. The window of opportunity with Trump is precisely because he, frankly, knows so little about the way that American power works, right? And his paradigm for international politics is so, comes out of the business world that he's, he and his people are the only people who see the world as potentially better if it looks like the way the Russians want to look like it, which is a big win for the Russians and a big loss for the United States. But precisely because of the way he's been boxed in by uh, these allegations and the increasing scandal over Russian ties, 
I think it's going to be very hard for him to make good on these promises. But you never say never. So. We're not under oath, uh, but I will confess that I did meet Sergei Kislyak, the ambassador <laughs> of Russia. So I'd like to thank Columbia University's Avril Harriman Institute, and I'd like to thank NYU's Boris Jordan Institute for the invitation. Uh, we don't have that much time left. That's one of the best things about going third, is you can rely on what's been said already and play off of it very nicely. I'm only going to make three points after a brief introduction. So um, it's very easy to make fun of Trump. I think uh, we've discovered this and are enjoying it every day. But the Trump campaign critique of US foreign policy uh, was uh, correct in many ways. Uh, there's not a solution in sight. The uh, administration, if it should get formed uh, at some point, uh, doesn't seem to promise a solution to the issues that it uh, pinpointed. Uh, but certainly, if you lived through the Cold War, you wonder how it was that we won the Cold War. Because that was really hard. And yet, the post-Cold War, somehow, we managed to lose it. And that would have seemed a lot easier. And so something has gone wrong. Whatever that uh, analysis might be, and there may be differences of opinion in this room about it, uh, Trump had quite a lot to say about that during the campaign. And it was very interesting to see the establishment's inability, in many cases, to argue on substance uh, about the critique. So that's by way of introduction. I believe that the fundamental strategy of some of the advisors around Trump is uh, misguided, although interesting. Still by way of introduction here. The notion that we're going to do a kind of reverse Nixon, that Nixon supposedly made the triangle bringing China onto our side against the Soviet Union, turning China, as it were, in the US favor, and therefore undermining the big communist bloc. And now Trump is going to bring Russia onto the US side as a major counterweight to China, because China is the bigger problem, and Russia is the potential ally. Uh, because China, like the Soviet Union, is supposedly very fragile. And if you just push hard on it enough, it's ready to collapse the way the Soviet Union collapsed. And so not only can Trump become Nixon with the reverse triangle, but he can also become Reagan, uh, bringing down the big other challenger to the US on the international scene. That more or less is the grand strategy of motivating the handful of people who are uh, so far employed in the administration. And I, I'm very pessimistic that there's really a basis for any of that. But nonetheless, uh, that's the idea. So that was by way of background. So the three points I'm going to make, uh, US-Russia interests are bad uh, because uh, US-Russia relations are bad because interests conflict. There's a fundamental conflict of interests, as the panelists before me alluded to. It's not a misunderstanding. It's not treat you a little bit better. It's not have more meetings. It's not figure out you know, what they're about, because we don't quite get it yet. There is a fundamental clash of interests, and there's no way to overcome that fundamental clash of interests. Now, you want better relations with Russia? It's simple. Grant them a complete free hand in their region. So. Georgia, you can do what you want. Ukraine, you can do what you want. Kazakhstan, you can do what you want. And maybe even the Baltic states, because once you begin to make concessions, the appetite grows. If we did that, if the United States did that, the relationship with Russia would be spectacular. It would be incredibly excellent. They would be extremely happy. There would be no need for a reset. That would be well beyond a reset. But if you're not going to say, that Russia can do anything it wants with Kazakhstan or Ukraine or any of the other trash can of stands that border Russia, well, then you're not going to have a very easy relationship with Russia, are you? 
And you can argue that that's unfair, that Russia should have a sphere of influence if America's gonna have a sphere of influence. You can make the Russian case that America's hypocritical, that America is in violation of international law. You can do all the things that the Russians do, and part of it has a basis in reality. All I'm saying is there's a fundamental clash of interests, and that's why relations are poor, and that's why they will stay poor. They can be improved, and they can be managed. The fundamental clash of interests need not lead to cold war or hot war. It could be much more competently managed. But the first thing you do to competently manage the relationship is to recognize the fundamental clash of interests. Second point. A Russian history in the modern era is explicable by asymmetry of power. They want to be, as was alluded to by the previous panelists, the great power or a great power, but they are never the great power and they are barely a great power. The Soviet economy was one third the US economy at peak. It's hard to measure. They didn't really have a market economy, as you know. Prices weren't real. So it's a difficult, complicated measurement, especially with the foreign exchange rates, but about one third. Today's Russian economy is probably 1 15th the size of the US economy. So from a third to a 15th. And that gap is not closing. Not closing. So there's this tremendous asymmetry of power. There's a military asymmetry of power as well. There's a soft power dimension to this. There's every single dimension, alliance systems, geography. Russia is not as strong and never will be as strong as the US and the West. That has been their problem since, that was Stalin's problem, that was the Tsarist regime's problem. That was Boris Yeltsin's problem, that was Gorbachev's problem, it's Putin's problem. And so they have recourse to a different model to try to, if not overcome this asymmetry, to manage this asymmetry. That recourse is to the state, the state and state power coercion, state involvement in the economy, curtailment of domestic rights and liberties, mobilization of internal resources, attempted division, sowing divisions in the West because the West is too strong. It is a geopolitical strategy that is very familiar for a long time right now. And you say what you will. For some Russians, they think it works. But if you look unsentimentally, soberly at the results of this, you do not see enduring great power status. You do not see prosperity for the population. You do not see human capital investment, right? So it is not a formula for enduring great power status, but it is the formula that Russia reaches for time and again in various different incarnations. We're living through another version of it right now. And finally, the third point I'd make is we have once again the conflation of a personal regime and Russian state interests. The preservation of the personal regime is now the single most important factor in Russian behavior. There's yet another fake election in 2018 where the president has to get reelected. In fact, it could well be that that election gets moved up to reduce the amount of time before the election so that nothing can potentially go wrong. In other words, they announce that the election is coming next week or in a month, and good luck with mounting a campaign in that election. We all know that he loves surprises and he loves to make these unexpected unilateral announcements. But whenever the election takes place, whether it takes place in spring 2018 or earlier, that's what they're about. They're about preservation of that personal regime. And now we're hearing that the preservation of the personal regime is Russian state interest. We're hearing this argument again. Again and again in Russian history, we hear this argument. Now, if you look at the asymmetry of power approach, the coercive asymmetry of power problem that they've got, 
and you look at the conflation of personal regime with Russian state interests, you can see that they're in a bad way. They're in a very bad way. Once again, the relationship can be better managed. There can be more competence on the U.S. side. There hasn't been a great deal of competence, as we were saying. That's why I, I think some of what Trump's critique uh, was spot on. But nonetheless, how are we supposed to have a better relationship when Russian state interests are subordinated to a personal regime's survival, and that personal regime is neither growing their economy, that is to say their prosperity, right, nor providing genuine security, it strikes me that that's not our obligation to have better relations for the sake of better relations with that personal regime conflated with Russian state interests. So in conclusion, I think I'm good with time. There'll be some time for Q&A and there'll be some time for the panelists, the other panelists, I hope, to interact with some of what I'm saying just as I am with what they're saying. So in conclusion, um, we have to discuss more soberly what are the overlapping interests. You saw panelist Dan go through what the Obama administration imagined might be the overlapping interests. I think from an Obama administration point of view, that was kind of reasonable approach, reasonable worldview, that those might be some overlapping interests and therefore there can be some cooperation. But the scale of those overlapping interests compared to the freehand sphere of influence in their region, which is the single biggest overlapping interest, and compared to preservation of the personal regime. All of those putative overlapping interests are minuscule in comparison to those two points. And that's the core problem. Oh. You can argue, it's not true in my view, but you can argue that we both should be fighting Islamist or Islamic or whatever you want to call it, terrorism together. That that's a shared interest. First of all, to the extent that that exists, we could debate already. But let's, for purposes of discussion, say that there is such an existential threat to uh, the world today and to American power, American interests. That is not a sufficient overlapping interest compared to the sphere of influence in their region question and the personal regime. It's not even close. And one could go on down the list. There's also a great deal of sentimentality about all those global problems that we could tackle together. And people begin to tick the list off. After Islamic terrorism, they say climate change. And then they say, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's the problem with the list. It's all et cetera. It's not specified. It's not clear to me, maybe we'll debate this, what that big package of global interests that a Vienna-style concert of great powers is going to tackle together. Most of those interests, in fact, are inimical to the existing Russian regime, which wants to preserve itself. Like, for example, the freedom, health, and well-being of its own population, let alone its neighbors. So I'm not so sanguine either about some agenda of large-scale international cooperation. However, I agree that, that some people do believe in that, and that's a debatable point. So what happens? In conclusion, what happens? What happens is... They come back and make nice for technology transfer purposes. Because this is the problem with the asymmetry of power. There's an asymmetry of power. The West not only is stronger, but it's got the technology. You want to drill in the Arctic? Well, guess what? One side can help you drill in the Arctic, and the other side can't drill in the Arctic by itself. And up and down history, we see again and again the attempt from the Russian side for rapprochement, which will often involve technology transfer or hoped for technology transfer because the West has better, more valuable technology. Russians have technology too. They have R&D. They have science and mathematics, as you know, on a high level. But there are many technologies that they can only acquire in the West. 
and this requires a rapprochement at some point, and then things get a little bit less tense, and then they blow up again because we've misunderstood them, because we've humiliated them, and so they have to take over the territory of their neighbors or whatever it might be. Right? This is the dynamic we've seen it again. It takes very different forms. The current regime is not the Soviet Union. Right? The Gorbachev Soviet Union was not Stalin's regime. No one is suggesting that there is a simplistic incarnation of Russia throughout history. I know the historical periods well. I'm just saying that there are some patterns here, deep and fundamental patterns. We could talk about the deep and fundamental patterns on the American side as well. So in that sense, I'm for better managing the extreme differences between the countries. Thank you. Um, thanks to all the panelists once again for uh, really scintillating presentation and getting so many different ideas out here. I would say if we sort of combine uh, the statements of all the panelists, we have kind of three big picture pieces that have been uh, raised here. We have the issue of Russian agreement, having to deal with maybe going back two decades worth of, of Russians' concerns of being mistreated, the status being mistreated, uh, in the ways that uh, US and, and Western relations with Russia have evolved over the past two decades. We have this big question uh, raised by Steve about the lack of overlapping interests, right? Whether there are fundamental uh, problems with interests between Russia and the West and Russia and the US. And then we have this big question of asymmetry of power that's been brought up uh, in, in, you know, in all of the talks. So what I want to do is push the panelists to add a, a dynamic element to their analysis. Because if you read about Russia in the news today, if, in particular if you read about the way Russia is being discussed in the US, you can get almost two completely contradictory pictures here. I was up at Columbia last week for a panel on cyber and Russia. Right? If we pay attention to discussion of what's going on in the Dutch elections, the French elections, the German elections, the US elections, there's this picture of Russia as this rising power who's mastered cyberspace in a way that's got the US on its heels. And this whole idea that Russia is, it has all these weapons and tools at its disposal. At the same respect, you can point to the fact that if you look at the proposed increase in the military budget from President Trump, I believe it, it exceeds the entire military budget of the Russian Federation, and if not, it's pretty close. So there's this other story going on, as Steve was talking about, about why would you want to move the Russian elections up? Well, one of the reasons to want to move the Russian elections up is because there is this impending concern about whether the economic uh, progress, the economic conditions in Russia can be maintained through 2018. It's not just the element of surprise to put the opposition on its heels, but the idea is that it's to move the election into safer ground before we get potentially more serious economic questions. I mean, from the point of view of people who study Russian public opinion, Russian domestic politics, one of the big questions about Russia is, if you look at work by, say, Daniel Treisman, for many years in the post-Cold War era, you had a real tracking of popularity of Russian leaders with Russian economic conditions. That then broke apart in the aftermath of Crimea. You got the sort of predicted rally around the flag effect, but we've now seen that lasting longer than a lot of people would have thought. So how much longer can popularity in the regime be maintained in Russia if economic conditions are going to continue to not get better? Or as Steve was saying, the interest of the regime not serving advancing the interests of the population. So I want to sort of push that back forward. What world are we in? Is Russia rising? in its strength vis-a-vis -vis the West? Is Russia falling in its strength vis-a-vis -vis the West? And what does that say for this peculiar, which I thought was very well stated uh, during the panel, conundrum that the Trump administration finds itself in, where it might want to pursue certain policies, but by pursuing exactly those policies, it will give further ammunition to its enemies who have said, oh, no, you're in the pockets of the Russians to start in the first place. Yvonne? So, uh uh, th those are really great questions, and so if it, just to sort of repeat, just so uh, I, I know what I'm talking about here, it seems that there's two different Russias, one of which seems to be invincible in terms of actions abroad, and another that, um, particularly from uh, Steve's discussion, has these truly massive shortcomings. In a sense, both of these are true. The, in the sense of 
Russia's decline relative to its peer competitors. This has happened before in history. It is happening right now. So its options are two, give up, essentially just give up the ghost, which would directly lead to President Putin giving up power directly, or try to do something. Directly challenging the West, if President Trump's proposed military increases are more than the military budget, that, that option is off the table. But what is everything in between? It could be the cyber attacks, it could be spreading misinformation, it could be these uh, small enough um, expansions into Western sort of interests that are big enough to make itself known, but not so big as to cause essentially counter intervention. So that is essentially what it's trying to do. It's trying to essentially manage the present so as to kick the future down, down the road, kick the sort of can down the road. And how much longer can it go? Uh, ostensibly, this will go for as long as President Putin's um, personal lifespan. Uh, he's not an old person. Uh, he, he'll be with us on this earth for quite a while. And so long as the Constitution was changed once, it can be changed another time. Um, and we'll get to the point that, you know, uh, one of my former bosses in Moscow, Carnegie Moscow Center, Dmitry Trenin, has this great line of, uh, Putin wants to be like Peter, like Peter the Great, but is afraid of ending up like Gorbachev, so he ends up like Brezhnev. <laughs> and so what we can see here is trying to elongate the present for as long as possible. Interesting. Um, I mean, I, I essentially agree with that. Um, I would add that, so what Russia has gotten good at for now, right, is essentially uh, information warfare targeted at liberal institutions, right? It's gotten good at things like uh, laundering WikiLeaks dumps in ways that um, undermine uh, an American presidential candidate. It's gotten good at creating an information universe, say, in Italy, that seems to be helping the Five Star Movement, right? Is that what it's called? I'm not an Italian specialist. Um, it seems to have gotten pretty good at these sorts of things, right? At, at, at using information warfare in the sense of, of flooding the cyber waves, right? Uh, in terms of setting some of the tone of discussion that makes it into the broader media ecosystem. Uh, and it can do things like give loans to far-right parties. Right? Because, you know, however bad the situation is for average Russians outside of Moscow and St. Petersburg, you know, you, you still have a petrol state sitting on you know, decent amounts of cash that can go a long way if you want to flood the coffers of, say, the, the National Front. So it's gotten good at this. Um, and it's not that it's awesome at it. Most of the stuff is pretty pedestrian. It does not require a great deal of sophistication. Western uh, intelligence agencies are capable of probably doing at least as much. Some Western uh, intelligence agencies are probably capable of doing more, right? Um, are probably more technically competent at these, at say, uh, cyber espionage. Um, but the thing is that right now it's happening in an environment where Russia has an enormous opportunity. It has an enormous opportunity because of the hangover of the Great Recession, right? So faith in Western institutions that are all time low. We're seeing very typical you know, sort of 30s-esque downturn rise in uh, right-wing populism, right? That's a polite term for some of it. Some of it's just right-wing populism, some of it's much worse. Um, uh, and so you have this confluence of things coming together, right? That the Russians have been able to exploit reasonably well, and then they got really, really lucky, or I think probably in the long term may prove to be unlucky, may turn, prove out to be a not a great thing that Trump was elected in the United States, but got lucky in terms of putting into power some of the United States who has, you know, sort of very little idea how to run foreign policy and is not interested in protecting the liberal order, right? Is not interested in trying to counter some of these moves, right? So it's like a golden opportunity, and Russia looks like it's riding it pretty well. But, you know, in a couple of months, maybe um, there's a left-wing coalition government in, in the Netherlands. Maybe, um, you know, there's a centrist in France, you know, and things look only slightly better for the Russians than they did before. So I think I, I, I don't want to overestimate that. Now, the danger is that this kind of hitting pressure points where Europe and the United States are vulnerable uh, has uh, sort of 
these amazing effects because of the environment, because of the political and economic environment, right? Uh, and so Russia could come out sort of doing real damage, right, to its rivals' security architecture and economic architecture, even though in the end of the day that's not going to help Russia very much, right? Uh, it's not going to help Russia deal with its underlying problems, and it's not really going to help Russia assert its great power prerogatives uh, in uh, its neighborhood. So. Steve? Russia rising, Russia declining. This seems to be a meme that a lot of such panels begin with. You know, spoilation isn't that hard. You can go out and build, you can have your kid build a big thing with blocks in kindergarten, mm. and some other kid can come along and give one little kick. And the blocks, if they're not built well, will tumble. And it took one kid maybe the whole week to build, and it took the other kid three seconds to knock down. So if you're trying to build democracy in Ukraine, that's one option. If you're trying to destabilize Ukraine and make sure you're not going to get democracy in Ukraine, well, that's a lot easier, isn't it? So I think that explains Russia's, quote, success. Uh, they're Spoilation is their game, and spoilation is not that hard. You know, uh, bomb Syria to the Stone Age or prior to the Stone Age? How hard is that? That's not that hard. You just drop the ordinance. Right? But build some type of coalition where the parties agree in a political process to come out of the Civil War? You know, good luck with that. And then rebuild the uh, country after that in economic terms, right? So spoilation explains in part the seeming success of the Russian side, but it gives them almost nothing. Second point, uh, you know, the more vulnerable stuff is, the more it's susceptible to spoilation. So if things aren't going well, if a bunch of elites get together and introduce a common currency without other common institutions, you get a certain vulnerability there. If a bunch of elites get together and cheat or misguidedly or misprice risk and the international financial system has a crash and they don't have to pay for it, the ones who caused it, well, you know, spoilation becomes kind of possible in that environment. If democracy is strong, if markets are strong, and I could go on, right? Spoilation is a lot harder. So the value of NATO and the EU, you don't have to know anything more about whether they're valuable, except to know that the Russians spent all their tr time trying to hurt them. The Russians are dead set against uh, their existence. Dissolving NATO and dissolving the EU are kind of pipe dreams, but these are the pipe dreams that Russia is pursuing. That tells you the value of them. If, those, if the EU and NATO didn't have any value, Russians wouldn't care about their existence. They wouldn't care about their expansion. Right? But the West is a powerful sphere of influence based upon voluntarism, shared ideals, and voluntary joining. And that's a lot to just walk away from and give up. You know, I remember when the CIA was trying to bring the Soviet Union down in something called rollback. And they didn't have much success. And then the general secretary of the Communist Party started dismantling the system. And I started to pinch myself. Is this happening? Is Mikhail Gorbachev destroying the Soviet Union? And he was. So the West could be destroyed. It can't be destroyed from the outside, uh, but it can be destroyed from the inside. I don't think we're going to see that, but that's now a question on the agenda, which wasn't on the agenda not long ago, certainly not before 2008. A final point. You know, the Russia thing, this is Albert Hirschman. You got exit and you got voice. So you got approximately 10 million Russians outside of Russia beyond the former Soviet space. And they're earning 20% above the median in all the countries they live in, whether that's the United States, Great Britain, Israel, and we could go on. So if they're earning 20% above the median, that tells you that that's the talent pool. That's the human capital. And they're not in the country. The whole middle class inside Russia is maybe 10 million strong. 
So that's the direction they're going. Push them out and fewer demonstrations internally, less potential dissatisfaction internally, and your human capital, your investments, your future, your energetic, dynamic, entrepreneurial people, they're contributing to Britain's GDP or Israel's GDP or whatever it might be. That's the, that's the path they're on right now. So that's a safety valve in terms of internal destabilization politically, and it is also uh, Self-destruction from a long-term point of view as a strategy, right? So in the meantime, though, the spoilation, right? I mean, what's cyber warfare? Cyber warfare is potentially 16 years old and no bottle of shampoo. I mean, that's how cheap cyber warfare is, right? You get a teenager, doesn't wash their hair, sits in front of the machine all day, goes on the sites where you can get download the hacking tools. Right? My kids now look at those sites, those hacking tool sites. They're both teenagers. And so cyber is a lot cheaper than mounting, you know, a, a, a mobile, amphibious capable military, which the United States is the only one in the world that has. Right? Chinese don't have it yet either. And the Russians don't have it either, right? So they can't do that. That's once again the asymmetry problem, but they can do the cyber warfare stuff and the cyber warfare stuff, it looks very scary, but um, it's not as scary as it looks because uh, we're just as good, if not better, at it than they are, and they haven't paid a price yet. Once you start introducing deterrence, once there's competence on the superpower side, then there's a different calculation on the other side. They've paid no costs yet uh, for the cyber stuff no significant costs, and I think that's a mistake. Thanks, Steve. Okay, let's open it up to questions, um, and just please wait for the microphone. Uh, to, or, or are they gonna line up? No. Oh, you're gonna bring it? Okay, so Kara will bring the microphone. And again, just state your name and your affiliation for uh, the record here, and who the question is. Uh, whatever you'd like. Stan. Stan. <laughs> we can see it, and I'm sure. I'm Elliot Greenspan. I'm the <clears throat> director of the Manhattan Project of the LaRouche Pack in this city. Uh, I work with Executive Intelligence Review. I would suggest to Professor uh, Kotkin, when you said that there is no solution in sight, I see a solution, and I'd like to put this forward for your consideration and those that of the panelists, uh, because it's a good thing we have a solution because this is an existential crisis. Uh, Professor Cohen, regularly addresses this on The Bachelor Show and in many venues, you know Professor Cohen, I'm sure, and this is damn serious. The, the post-war, the liberal order has collapsed. Trump was elected, that was a shock. Why was he elected? Why did Brexit occur? Because the old order, the old geopolitical order has collapsed. The transatlantic financial system is bankrupt. That crisis has not gone away. In that context, you have a new paradigm, which presumably you know of this, the Belt and Road Initiative, led by China, which now has spread to about 66 countries, over 4 billion people benefiting into Africa, into Iberia America, okay. into I'm, Eastern I'm sorry, Rich, can you formulate it in the form of a question so we I can will. get others participating too? Thank and you. Trump, who wants to build infrastructure in this country, Trump and Putin want to make America and Russia great again, there is a pathway to do that, which is for this administration, unlike Obama's, to join with this Belt and Road Initiative. Trump is invited to the summit in Beijing on this matter in May. Because of that, there is this McCarthyite police state operation from British intelligence, Obama, Soros, to okay, destroy. So I, I'm okay, coming. I'm, I'm coming. No, I'm gonna. To, I'm, I'm, to okay, I'm gonna have to cut you off now. Just yeah, just I mean, let me ask my you, question. You've yeah. got Cohen. You've got yeah. Soros. You've got apologies for the Chinese authoritarian <laughs> communist regime. What else you got? Yeah. Let it no, all we out. have we have the spread of an American <laughs> economic system of development in much of the world. That's the unique pathway to the solution, which you left out because okay. you're okay. sitting in a uh, geopolitical universe, okay. which gave us a couple of world wars and a cold war and threatens a third. So my question is... Yeah, did Hitler what, have anything to do with those wars? Let me ask my did question. Did Stalin I, have anything to do with those sh wars? Shall we engage I mean, in a dialogue? I know, but I mean, we're in dialogue right now. You said the nonsense you said, 
and I'm saying the nonsense Good. I'm saying, and the, the audience will figure it out. The subject here is reset. And I suggest the reason there's a problem for Trump to do a reset is this damn McCarthyite attack, which is, okay. which is destroying the Democratic Party, my party, and destroying the country. Okay. So I, I, I'd ask your thinking about that and about this solution. Okay, so does anyone want to take on the question of domestic politics and McCarthyism so or the Belt and Road? This is the same argument that you're seeing Glenn Greenwald and other people on the left make, right, the sort of, the, the sort of far left, that uh, essentially um, we're seeing a return to McCarthyism because of concerns about Russian ties. Um, I would suggest that that's itself a tactic designed to shut down a really important line of inquiry about uh, the relations between the president and his inner circle and a foreign authoritarian regime. You know it's not McCarthyite because nobody's being hauled before committees and being told to disclose their associates all across the U.S. government, all across Hollywood, all across other things. So the McCarthyite label is a completely inappropriate way to describe what's happening. If we start to see something that looks like McCarthyism, we will know it. Right? And so I just don't think it's that interesting. Now, domestically, there, alter there, is, a, there is a fundamentally a problem here, right? which is that the way in which globalization occurred from the 90s onward did promote high levels of inequality. Right? And those high levels of inequality are now coming around to bite right, the liberal order in the butt. Right? Uh, inequality, the, the financialization of political economy, these are serious issues. Right? So one way you can address it is through kind of faux populism and massive deregulation, which is the Trump way, right, which is essentially to, to sort of just simply change the judicial politics of what elites get benefit from it. Another way to do it would be through a larger progressive ag equality agenda focused on both domestic and international institutions to do things like serious trade compensation, serious trade adjustment. That was, I think, a debate that was within, happening within the, the Democratic Party uh, during the election and I think is probably the direction that the Democratic Party will ultimately head in. So. Yeah, mm -hmm. so let me just um, uh, sort, of, sort of two different things which may be of, so, of some interest. Um, one, so we had a question, so when uh, Josh was asking earlier, uh, how is Russian popularity work? Like how does President Putin's popularity seem to be bulletproof, um, you know, no matter what happens to the economy? Uh, so one of the things about so what's happening here in the United States is there is this very vibrant um, political debate on essentially what should happen. Uh, and the way that does not work in Russia uh, is probably one of the most curious things. Um, Josh mentioned Dan Treisman, Tim Fry, who was here a bit earlier, uh, have written about this to an extent. And what happens in Russia itself is you can say all manner of nasty things about the country, the system. You can criticize everything, the holes in the road, but you don't criticize President Putin directly. You can say all the worst things in the world, but if you criticize him, well, that is putting you outside of the political mainstream. And that essentially not only puts you out of the political mainstream, that says that you are outside of essentially the Russian body politic. And that is really a way in which political debate on serious things gets shut down. The, um, the implication that criticism of the leader is the betrayal, is the treason itself. Um, and in terms of so part of the, I guess, the intro to the question was, what about this One Belt, One Road initiative? Um, and for those who are not familiar, um, one, Alexander Cooley has this uh, great new piece for CSIS, um, which you can learn, read, and it's pretty great. And that is this 10-year, $1 trillion infrastructure project to make, essentially, Shanghai pave the road all the way to uh, Hamburg or something. So from China to Europe, all the infrastructure you need. One of the reasons that Russia rhetorically is very much in favor, but in practice does not do very much, is this does not go through Russia. And one thing that I've, I've heard before and sort of like uh, sort of could just sort of convey to you, when we think of Central Asia, um, we think of a post-Soviet region. And it's probably much more useful to think of Central Asia as a pre-China region. And in that context, when we say Central Asia is pre-China, the Russian economic influence in this region has collapsed uh, since the 2008-9 financial crisis. Mm. So part of this one belt, one road thing, which is very exciting to people who are not Russia, is that it will, it'll, you know, if it works, it's great. 
but it doesn't benefit Russia. And what, how it doesn't benefit Russia is as Russia maintains the security guarantees to these countries, they're losing essentially like salami tactics of the days of yore, all the other social and economic influence to Turkey and to China, and they'll end up essentially locked out of, uh, locked out of their own room. Um, I, I could go on about the Belt and Road, but let's get bring in, <laughs> bring in some people in the back. Uh, Jiva, restraint. Hi, thanks for a great panel. Um, I'm oh, Bijan Salahizadeh. Hey, my, I work in a healthcare private equity firm, so my, I have no affiliation that's relevant. Um, my question is primarily for Professor Kock and for the whole rest of the panel. The topic here is about the reset. I'm curious if we look forward even beyond a potential reset or lack thereof, what happens when Putin is incapable of running the country or dies despite his shirtless appearance? At some point, the man won't be in power anymore, potentially. What, what is the fortune of the country when it's so closely tied to Vladimir Putin directly? What, you know, if you could push forward, where, where do we go in that, in that future of 10 to 20 years from now? Maybe that's for you guys. Um, so, so I'd say just a, a quick thing, what does post-Putin Russia look like? Following on the earlier comments of Professor Kotkin about the personalist power, this is a thing that has happened before. There will be um, essentially what you know, Winston Churchill said that Russian, Russian internal politics, Kremlin you know, court intrigue, the bulldogs are fighting underneath the carpet and you only know who won once the bones start flying out. When the president comes to an end, whether it is for political reasons or you know, we all have to leave this earth at some point, there will be an attempt to figure out, is there anyone around who can essentially maintain the status quo? And the answer is over time, there's been always the enthusiasm for finding that guy, and they don't find that guy. Because each person who is able to survive for 20, 30 years has some unique set of, um, some unique set of talents. The next guy won't come in after the bedlam of the 1990s. The next guy won't come in essentially to try to make Russia great again. So what will happen at that point is, sort of like Professor Kotkin was saying, there will be a person who will essentially address the rest of Russia, the rest of the world, and say, all these difficulties that we've had, things happen, difficult words were said, but why don't we attempt some sort of rapprochement? Why don't we attempt to sort of reset our relationship? The idea being, you bring in foreign technology, capital, expertise, all of these different things in order to bring Russia back up. Because at the moment, that if things continue as they are, Russia will be, as they are right now, falling behind their peer competitors. And they will need huge influx of technology transfer, foreign direct investment, a much more benign international environment. And the only person who can deliver that is someone who can credibly say, difficult words were said, let's move past, let's move forward. So it's definitely going to be a much friendlier person in terms of rhetoric, whoever follows next. Thomas? Okay, I, I want to actually say one thing about that. Yeah. The, the problem, so there's, there's the sort of internal pattern, which is what we're talking about here. The problem is, is that we don't know what the world is going to look like in 10 or 20 years, right? I mean, I, I, I don't say that in a flippant way. We really don't know what the world is going to look like in 10 or 20 years. And a world in which... Uh, China, for example, is the leading economic power, and this happens, mm -hmm. is a very different world from one in which a kind of Euro-Atlantic bloc mm -hmm. is the leading economic power when this happens, right? Let's say, for example, that the Russians, that Moscow, Putin gets what he really wants, right, and NATO dissolves, right? Uh, that's a world potentially with uh, Germany as a great military power, right? That looks really different, right, from a Russian strategic perspective and a Russian domestic perspective than a world in which uh, the US is essentially uh, paying to reduce security dilemmas within Europe, right? And so that's the only caveat I would have is that um, uh, that has tremendously different ramifications depending upon the distribution of power and the distribution of economic vitality when Russia decides it wants to, who is, in other words, who is the rapprochement going to be with, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you going. all to the panelists for an interesting um, set of presentations. Let me follow up from where Steve left off on the question of, you know, if 
there's such asymmetry, asymmetry of power and asymmetry of interests um, going forward, what's the cost of no reset? In other words, um, uh, Russia can go a couple of different directions. The United States could certainly do just fine unless Russia pursues a policy of raising risks. Right? You don't need to have the same, uh, you don't need to have equal power with the United States to assert your power in a much higher risk strategy. And we've seen some of this with the Russian nuclear threats and so on. Uh, and the US hasn't engaged this, but um, has responded only minimally in NATO. But if the, if, if the US ignores and doesn't have a reset, so where will Russia be? It can become, uh, keep going forward as an appendage, a resource appendage of China. Uh, China is continuing to expand in this region uh, of such interest, not only with um, OBOR, but also with its currency, right? And Russia, Putin had hoped to turn this into a region originally not that long ago where Russia could project its power with the ruble. That's completely dead and will never come back. In Europe, without a reset, uh, the Europeans will either uh, meander through, muddle through, or redefine the EU, but they'll somehow probably survive, and they can survive without Russia. So my question is, what's wrong with the sort of unhappy but um, muddling through strategy, uh, Russia is weak, uh, don't uh, provoke them, um, manage to contain them, and uh, politely ignore them, uh, engage them as much as you can, and not have such grandiose uh, images that we have to engage on global issues when maybe we don't have to engage on such global issues if they don't provoke us. So what's the cost of that? Good question. Uh, well. Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, I mean, I, I wrote a piece for the Monkey Cage blog uh, right after Crimea where I basically said, argued that the failure of the reset was more Putin's problem than Obama's problem, right, for precisely these reasons, right, that, that ultimately, um, as you've heard everybody say, Russia needs the United States more than it needs Russia, than, than the United States needs Russia. Uh, I still hold that even with some recent Russian successes that we've talked about. Um, that in the long term, structurally, you're right. But I think you're also right to point out that, that it's not, the problem is, is that there are irritants that are structural that can't be ignored, right? So Ukraine is now on the table as one of these, right? Um, potentially Georgia, right, is one of these. Um, and even if you say, well, let's just concede um, former Soviet space, space as much as we can, uh, there's still the Baltic states, right? And there's still um, the effort to scare the bejesus out of Sweden and Finland, right? So this risk strategy, um, the problem is that, that you can't, because of NATO expansion and because of the structure of US security partnerships, you can't ignore, right, the risk strategy, which then creates, you know, concerns about escalation, right? Miscalculation, all those sorts of things. So I, I don't think that we need, a, I don't think we need a grand bargain, right? I don't think the US ought to be particularly behaving hawkishly towards Russia either. Um, but I do think that, that some sort of management of relations needs to happen. And right now there is frankly nothing, right? We're back, we're, we're, we're be, we are worse off in many respects in terms of that basic infrastructure of just bilateral relationship management than we were uh, before the reset, right? And so there needs to be something to at least routinize these relationships. And I, I wanna ask you all actually on this point, um, could things get even worse in the sense that, you know, there was a sense that everything could be transformed, right? The nature of the world order, right? I mean, everything that was coming out from sort of a lot of Trump's people about, you know, not defending liberal internationalism and NATO not doing first, that a lot of Russian commentators actually took that seriously. And when push comes to come, because we haven't seen the Trump administration in a crisis yet, right? The crises at the moment are self-inflicted, right? The default, given all of the architecture, right, is the order that the US has built. At that point, um, is, is, are things even worse for Russia in the sense that they badly miscalculated you know, the ability to transform? So part, so part of the answer to that is, you know, what does, you know, 
Russia has a great power, what does like system change look like in mm. practice, that instead of having this, let's say, international liberal order in which the United States provides, you know, not a public good, but a club good of security more or less everywhere, whoever wants to join in gets it. The alternative is Russia having a, uh, the world essentially having a series of bilateral relations. And then it's just basically who has more weight, who has more gravity in each one of these matchups. The United States in general would win most of these things. China, most of these in general. Russia, much fewer. So the, the danger of the status quo, and, and the status quo of essentially as the lady's question was, what's wrong with inaction? President Obama had, and I also wrote a piece for the monkey cage on this thing, is the, the neo-containment of Obama was the Russians will go into, have gone into Ukraine, we're not gonna eject them, but we'll basically see how long this takes before Russia collapses. That was President Obama's, um, his strategy, and who knows what uh, President Clinton would have done. The consequence for that of, you know, having the series of bilateral relations of Russia and its neighbors is that without the United States providing general security, well, then Russia has to do it. So the security costs start to go through the roof. And how that is being funded as is within sort of Russia's sort of sphere of interest is, and you know, this is sort of the, the painful thing is I lived in Russia for, in Moscow for like four years. It gets balanced on the budget of the actual Russian domestic consumption. So Russia gets poorer in order to maintain these foreign, these foreign affairs. And so even if the economy goes from negative 3.7 of last year, that's a positive 0.2 this year. Over time, that's the recipe for at best stagnation, at worst, another societal collapse. And like, I unironically love Russia, it's a great place. Um, and that's bad for Russia, I, I would say. Okay. My name is Anna Popkova. I'm a, an assistant professor at the Western Michigan University School of Communication. I was here to see family and stayed one more day just to attend this. So thank you, this was great. Um, my question goes back to the point about uh, fundamentally diverging interests or fundamental clash in, in, in interests. And I'm gonna pose two questions here. One is, have these interests always been so fundamentally divergent? And that's where I'm getting to my main question. What do you think has the role of media and journalism on both sides, Russia and US, been in the evolution or transformation and ups and downs of this relationship? And as you think about the prospects of the relationship and our current media environment, what role do you, what media journalism role do you see, do you think will play in the prospects of the relationship? Thank you. So thank you for that. So, um, why don't the, you take that one? The, I think why don't you guys take that one? I think Josh is the, the media, mm -hmm. media person yeah, here. He can, he can handle that one. But well, I'll ask after Josh, everyone, if they want to chime in with your final sort of 30 second takeaway. Mm -hmm. Um, well, does anyone have, I mean, I can, I can talk about social media and we'll actually talk much more about social media as this, as this series goes on. Does anyone want to walk, talk in on, the, on this question about the role of the media has played you go for in it, this one way or the other? Well, I had something else I wanted to say, <laughs> but, uh, but not on this. I mean, I think, I don't have a good answer. I mean, I don't, I, I the question of whether, is, is your question essentially, whether this exact, whether the media has played a role in exacerbating the sense of this discordant interest. I mean, because st what, what Steve's talking about here is a very much underlying fundamental, right, difference in what Russia's role should be in the affairs of countries that are on its border now, that did not historically used to be independent countries for the most part, right, or in not in the recent Soviet past or historic countries. If you look at it that way, that this is a fundamental underlying conflict here, right, then how it gets discussed is probably less important than the existence of the conflict in the first place, right? On the other hand, if you think, if you wanna think about media per se as being seen as part of the liberal international order, that there are these efforts to have a free media and open press, and that the open press plays a role of holding governments accountable, Right? And that that's something that is encouraged, that was encouraged by Western institutions, Western governments, uh, parts of the US government during the 1990s and the 2000s, playing this role in Russia. I mean, one of the things that we've seen that's kind of uh, underlaid so some of the breakup of relations between Russia and the West is this sort of systematic expulsion of 
uh, organizations out of Russia or the voluntary decision to leave out of Russia. And some of the stuff that those organizations were doing was within Russia dealing with this issue of trying to train what a, what a press does in a democratically responsible society. Now, there's a flip side of this right now, which goes back to the sort of, it's the other side of the cyber question, which is the role that's being played now by RT and other aspects of Russia's, um, the sort of exporting of Russian domestic uh, approaches to managing news to try to export this to a sort of further thing. And I think this is, a, is an excellent subject for this seminar as we move forward, which is beginning to wrestle in a much longer period of time about that role, which I think is that we talked about cyber in terms of hacks today, but there's this other big question of, of, of working in this regard. So, so I, think, I think the analogy of what's happened in the media space, international media space, since you know, the apex of the liberal world order, say in the 1990s, is a really useful one, right? Because um, you know, a lot of the pushback you against, uh, uh, that, that I get from policymakers about RT is, well, is RT really influential? No one really actually watches it, right? And Russia doesn't actually have true soft power. Um, you know, it has this sort of you know, spoiler kind of thing, but you know, RT doesn't qualify for soft power in terms of promoting a positive image for Russia in that class soft power way. But I think what RT has managed to do very successfully um, is to put the spotlight on the contradictions within liberal democracies themselves, right? On social in, uh, inequalities, on uh, uh, when we had uh, you know, questions about racial policing. Um, all these kinds of issues RT covers, right? And so there is a sense that, uh, uh, you know, again, looking for the buttons, looking for the points, it's more successful in talking about Western hypocrisy and double standards, right, than promoting Russia. The other thing I will say is, um, you know, RT has a budget. Sputnik has a budget. CCTV has a budget. You want to promote global media? You need to pay for it, right? Do you know how many um, foreign bureaus, pop quiz to end with, CCTV has in Africa? How many? Over two dozen. Right? Do you know how many they have in Latin America? A dozen. Right? So what's the combined CNN bureaus in those places? Like two and a half. <laughs> yeah. Right? So there's a sense if this is, you know, if you're serious about world order, if you're serious about, um, you know, this architecture of media and information, you got to pay for it. Right? And simply put, so the budget cuts at the BBC, uh, uh, you know, and all these other sort of outlets aren't matching the emergence of these emerging power media or whatever you want to know. We use the term. Um, but I agree, this would be a great session uh, to follow up on. So you guys aren't going to get a 30-second reprise. We're done. Thank you, audience. Uh, thank you for coming, and we'll see you in April 27th. Bye.